after William Shakespeare. Okay. Now, uh, this person, uh, you know, is a scholar. Is a true scholar. So he has coined so many terms. He was he's well versed in Latin. He's well versed in Greek. Yeah, Spanish, etc. So he had, this person has coined many uh, neologic terms in English. Okay. Now, yeah. So. I told you the age of Milton was very complex. Uh, this age is known as age of transition. I told you why it is known as age of transition because it witnessed uh, the, I mean, uh, a power change from a Roman Catholic to a Puritan, hmm? Puritan age. Okay. Charles Fist and his followers were Roman Catholics, whereas Oliver Cromwell hmm? and the parliamentarians were Puritans or Protestants. Okay, so this age is popularly known as the age of transition, very complex. Uh, yeah, so he, what are the major features of this period? Human equality and liberty replace the divinity of the king so far uh, until 1649. Uh, you know, uh, yeah, king was the supreme <coughs> authority of England. But after hmm, Oliver Cromwell, uh, he became the king of England. Uh, he started to give importance to commonplace peop uh, pe people. Okay, so yeah, and you know why people? Why did people hate Charles II? Because Charles II was very luxurious. Okay, Charles II was very luxurious. He uh, imposed heavy tax upon the people to fund his war, uh, etc. So that was the reason why parliamentarians. Hmm, uh, along with yeah, uh, along with Oliver Cromwell, parliamentarians executed him. Okay, so the P, the uh, yeah, Roman Catholicism yielded to Protestantism and Puritanism in six between uh, the uh, period from 1649 to 1660. Now, okay, so parliamentarians become the prominent, uh, yeah, authorities in the England. Okay, I told you in 1642 what happened, civil war broke out, then in 1660. Uh, Charles II was restored to monarchy. That is why the period is known as Restoration Era. Okay, Charles II, who was in exile, who was in France uh, after the death of Oliver Cromwell, uh, these, I mean, royal authorities, I mean, those people who followed King, they brought him back from France. Okay, now. This era after, yeah, in 1660, England witnessed uh, uh, urbanization because, you know, France is the place of all sort of mannerism, fashion, etc., etc. So when Charles II uh, came back to, you know, England, he has brought all those mannerism, popularly the age of loose morals. Okay. Yeah. Loose morals. Urbanized England. Now, so in this poem, we will discuss, uh, sorry. Uh, yeah. Uh, in this block, we will discuss the po uh, poems of George Milton on the morning of Christ's nativity, then El Penisero, L'Allegro, Lycidas, and two sonnets. Yeah. And let me tell you something. Uh, see, in these poems, you can see, of course, John Milton is a religious poet. But uh, when you go for a three-dimensional reading, or a multiple interpretation, you can see England's political history is reflected in his poems. Okay, his religious at the same time, <clears throat> some political traits can be seen in his poems. Okay, so most of his poems are allegorical in nature, allegorical poem. Okay, so this is the first uh, prominent poem written by John Milton when he was a scholar at. Uh, Cambridge University. Okay. So, on the morning of Christ's nativity, also known as Nativity Art, written in 1629, hmm, when he was just 21. It appeared in the collection of poems known as Poems of John Milton. Okay. Now, the poem deals with the theme of coming age and religion, or even though it talks about the very birth of Jesus Christ. Let me tell you, the poem has two sides, two readings. It's a symbolic poem. In this poem, he talks about the morning of Christ's nativity. That means the birth of Jesus Christ. Actually, he is talking about on another side of the poem. He's talking about the very, uh, you know, 
<coughs> period of what he called Oliver Cromwell. See, uh, uh, in 1649, he enthroned as the king of England. Oliver Cromwell, the Protestant king, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, the Protestant uh, has uh, enthroned as the king of England. So in this poem, he also talks about the very beginning of the the very beginning of the era uh, of Oliver Cromwell. One side Oliver Cromwell, another side Jesus Christ. Okay. So both in yeah both uh, have been taken as the embodiment of what do you call humanity hmm? in this poem. So poem not only celebrates Christ's nativity but also it discusses about the changes brought by Oliver Cromwell in England. Okay, please note that point. <coughs> so it is the first greatest poem uh, written by John Milton. Then, yeah. Uh, so. Uh, apart from the um, Christ nativity or the birth of Jesus Christ, he also discusses about the uh, uh, the very over um, see how the earthly and pagan kings were pagan uh, powers were overthrown from the earth after the birth of Jesus Christ. So, me see, let me tell you something. <coughs> this John Milton is a staunch Protestant. Okay, he's a yeah hardcore Protestant. So he was against all other religions. Okay, he was against all other religions. So, uh, uh, yeah, any religion other than Christianity, hmm? other than Christianity, is regarded, uh, yeah, is regarded as pagan. Okay, pagan. Uh, so for um, because uh, you know Hindus, especially Hindus, yeah, uh, we, yeah, we follow the idols, right? So. Milton was entirely against that. So we can see that in this poem, he criticizes those people who follow uh, other religion and worship other pagan gods, like in Egypt, uh, Mesopotamia, uh, ancient India. We have, our, isn't it? We have our own deities and yeah, our own rituals. So he's criticizing such things in this poem. Please note that. Now, as I discussed the very historical background of the poem, uh, so what made them <coughs> turn against Charles I I told you Charles I, uh, yeah, uh, imposed a heavy tax upon the people to fund his war and for his luxurious lifestyle. That is the reason why parliamentarians and other group, uh, commonplace people turned against him. And he was beheaded in 1649. Their start and in 16, six, uh, yeah, 1649 uh, onwards uh, starts the era of Oliver Cromwell. Uh, on other side, we can say the very birth of Jesus Christ, who came to protect hmm, humankind. Same, similarly, here John Milton says that Oliver Cromwell became the king of England, so has to uh, take care of the uh, interest and needs of commonplace people in England. <coughs> yeah. So the first poem that is on the morning of Christ's nativity. Yeah, it uh, the poem is divided into two sections, introductory stanza and the hymn. So introductory part is prefaced by four stanzas. So uh, four stanzas contain seven lines each. So yeah, the first five uh, lines uh, yeah, are written in iambic pentameter. I have told you what an iambic pentameter is in the first class. And the very rhyming scheme of the poem is A, B, A, B, B. Okay, and the last two lines that is sixth and seventh line is written in i am big hexameter okay <clears throat> Unstre yeah unstressed followed by stressed is said to be i am so like that there will be five feet in a line that is said to be i am big pentameter if there are six then is hexameter seven hepta now after the introductory section poem has got hymnal was hymnal me hymnal <coughs> there starts the actual poem so him comprises 27 stanzas okay comprises 27 stanza so eight lines followed uh, yeah eight lines the first six lines are made up of two tercets that means a stanza of three lines okay stanza of three lines uh written in trimeter then uh, third line in pentameter then after those tercet we can see that Poet has followed tetrameter. So after Chaucer and Spencer, poets <coughs> who belong to the 17th century, from yeah, 17th century, they have employed meters from 
iambic monometer to iambic heptameter okay they employed all those meters in their poem i do uh, i repeat monometer to heptameter and mostly metaphysical poets employed trimeter to <coughs> yeah hexameter trimeter to hexameter it varies now okay so on the morning of christ nativity composed in 16 29 so <coughs> in the first stanza uh if you have the book page number 45 this is the month and this is the happy morn where in the son of heavens an eternal king of wedded maid and virgin mother born our great redemption from above did bring for so holy sages once did sing that he our deadly forefeet should release uh, with his father work us for special peace so in this uh, first stanza poet says that the savior of the world was born mm -hmm. has prophets foretold Mm -hmm. He has come to earth to release us from the penalty of sin and to bring eternal peace on the earth. The first stanza talks about, uh, yeah, it gives an introduction about the very birth of Jesus Christ. I repeat, uh, in the first stanza, he talks about the month of December. He says that the savior of the earth was born, mm -hmm. as prophet foretold. And he, yeah, he has come to earth to release us from our sin. Yes and to restore etern uh, eternal peace on earth. <coughs> and in the second stanza, if you have the text, that glorious form, that light unsufferable, that far beaming blaze of majesty, uh, where within he won he at heaven's high, council table to sit the midst of trinal unity. He laid aside he here with us to be, forsook the courts of everlasting day, chose with us darksome house of mortal clay. So let me te uh, tell you something. Jesus Christ, actually, he be he already belonged to the community of three gods, isn't it? Uh, Trinity. He belonged to the Trinity. But, you know, he abandoned all his luxuries and all his pleasures uh, of, of heaven and he came on earth why he has left that exalted position in the heaven uh, so has to take care of hmm, uh, human beings so the thing is on other another side let me tell you oliver cromwell he could have simply lived uh, his uh, leisurely life along with his family but he became the king of england so has to take care of the needs of the common people ordinary people in england yeah, just like Charles Fess or James Fess or any other uh, Catholic king, he could have celebrated his life, hmm? enjoyed his life. Instead, he was busy, you know, protecting his people and punishing all the, all those, uh, what do you call, uh, uh, people who <clears throat> tortured commonplace people so he, he is actually indirectly comparing oliver cromwell to um, jesus christ okay now say heavenly muse shall not thy scared way afford a present to the infant god hath thou no words no hymn no solemn stream to welcome him to this new abode how sorry now while the heaven by sun stream untrue hath took no print of the approaching light and all the sprangle horse keeps stars in, yeah, <coughs> uh, horse keep the watch in squadron bright. So in this stanza, he says that hmm, heavenly muse, that means stars, oh, entire cosmos, universe, they are waiting, eager, uh, they are waiting for Jesus Christ. Yeah, so eagerly waiting for Jesus Christ. So he's asking heavenly muse, don't you know? Uh, don't you have a gift for the Jesus Christ? Hmm? <clears throat> he is coming to earth. Okay. Now, so in the fourth stanza, I mean, fourth stanza of the introduction paragraph. Yeah, introduction, introductional uh, stanza. Uh, see how far for upon the earth. Yeah, see how far upon the eastern road the star led bizarre haste the order sweet o run prevent them with thy humble ore and lay it lowly at the blessed feet have thou the honor fest thy lord to greet and joy the voice unto the angel squire from out his secret altar touched with uh, hollow fire so <clears throat> when jesus christ was one we know 
uh, that so many people from different part of the world, especially the Magis from East, they all yeah the wise men, they they have reached hmm, the barn and they have also brought gift for Jesus Christ. So the poet is asking the uh, stars and other universal power, don't you have a gift for Jesus Christ, the eternal King, hmm? the King of Earth, the King of Heaven has come to Earth, hmm? so as to provide salvation to people so has to uh, re release human beings from their sins okay <clears throat> so yeah in the first two uh, what do you call it? in the first two stanzas of the introduction he described role of christ play in uh what christian uh, yeah in christian doctrine so we we know i have already described uh why jesus christ was born on earth it is to uh <laughs> redeem our sins mm? and also in stanza three and four, uh, he is asking the muses, I mean, the protectors or the guardian of the sky and the world, hmm, uh, to attend Jesus Christ. See, our king is coming. Don't we have a gift for him? Hmm? Please attend him. Then, see, this these wise men hmm, from East, they have already uh, given Jesus Christ gifts. So, you have to uh, give him something better than them is asking to the stars okay so that's all about the introductory stanza introductory stanza here poet is giving uh what do you call a hint to the reader about the birth of jesus christ why he has born on earth mm? he already belonged to the uh, community of uh, three gods that is trinities father son and holy spirit actually he could have enjoyed his uh, leisurely life in heaven but still he came to earth so has to take care of his subjects just like oliver cromwell okay so that is the very gist of the introductory stanza now i would like to provide a, a details de yeah, details about pagan gods discussed in the poem i told you all other deities and god goddesses from other religions other yeah uh other than Christianity is regarded as <coughs> pagan gods. Okay. Yeah, Apollo. We know that Apollo belongs to Greek mythology, isn't it? Greek and Roman mythology. Young solar god of light, truth, prophecy, god of archery, etc., etc. Mm? Then Anubis, mm? Egyptian god. Again, Aten, Egyptian. Brahma, mm? Hindu creator. I mean, Hindu god. Coyote, yeah, uh, African god. Okay. So, Egypt, Africa, <coughs> uh, that on, I mean, other countries in Africa, then uh, Greece, then Rome, then England, sorry, not England, India, all these countries have their own <coughs> mythology and their own deities. Hmm? They have their own rituals. So, anyway, Milton, who's a Protestant, considered these type of worships and idolizing uh, <coughs> deities as profane. That is why he is attacking such kind of sentiments and uh, uh, what do you call belief system in the poem. I told you the poem is actually an attack against pagan uh, worship or other uh, belief system, hmm? uh, belief system other than Christianity. Hello, people. Are you there? Hello, students. Are you there? Hello. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Okay. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> okay. So after the four stanza, yeah, we do have one, two, three, four. Yeah, four stanzas. Uh, there after the four stanza, there uh, starts the hymnal verse. Hymnal. The actual poem begins. Okay. So yeah, <coughs> it was the winter wide with. While the heaven born child, all meekly wrapped in root manger lies, nature in oak to him had dropped her gaudy trim with her great master to sympathize. It was no season then for her to wanton with son her lusty paramour. So, in the first stanza of, of uh, in the hymnal verse, poet talks about it was in the middle of <coughs> winter. Hmm? Jesus Christ was born when nature removed all her adornment, just mm, just like Jesus Christ has disrobed himself of the glory. 
so yeah let me tell you some uh, something during summer season spring season uh yeah uh, even in the autumn season mm, earth is you know uh very beautiful to look at isn't it yeah the entire earth will be filled with flowers mm, of different uh colors then <clears throat> yeah earth will be very colorful during summer spring and autumn season but in winter season what happens almost all creatures go for hibernation uh after harvesting uh, i mean people they enjoy yeah they enjoy a indoor life isn't it and at least some part of the northern hemisphere will be covered with snow there won't be any type of uh, flowers or colorful things hmm, on earth except that white blanket that is the snow so here uh, in poet's imagination poet says that earth will <laughs> remove all her adornments all her jewelries actually jewelry here jewelry or the adornment means uh what do you call flowers plants trees etc so in winter season earth won't be having any kind of decoration simply she'll be covering with white snow that is white blanket just like jesus christ when he uh took birth on earth he disrobed all his heavenly glories so the condition of the earth and heaven is same sorry <laughs> jesus christ and heaven is same so the poet is asking see nature nature he is addressing the nature no more coverting with your lover mr sun hmm? <clears throat> see you have to turn your attention from the sun now you need to attend jesus christ so nature her paramour her partner is sun so here yes, poet says that nature is coverting or making love with the sun now it is high time that she should turn her attention towards nature should turn her attention towards jesus christ in the second stanza only yeah only with speech fair she wore the gentle air to hide her uh, guilty front with snow show and on her naked shame pollute with the sinful blame okay so when uh she got the call nature became aware of her hmm, sin hmm? Uh, yeah now she is naked she is vulnerable and nature feels ashamed okay she asked the wind to please hmm? uh yeah ask the wind to cover her up hmm? with a veil of snow okay uh so here the poet is informing <coughs> the nature okay winter has approached hmm? remove all your adornments all your jewelry because even the great king he has dis disrobed himself from the uh <clears throat> what he called heavenly glories so nature is all, all, also removing all her adornments all her jewelry and uh, he she is asking the wind to cover her with white blanket that means no uh previously as she was making love with the sun she was naked hmm? now only now when she got the heavenly colony she remember she realized the mistake she has committed she is naked she is vulnerable so she is asking the wind to give her the, the dress the dress given by the wind is no so that she will be very presentable in front of the king so she covered herself with the snow so in the third stanza but he here uh, but he uh, but he <coughs> hears one second <coughs> but he uh, her fears to see sent down to the meek eyed piece she crowned with olive green came softly sliding down through the turning spear his ready harbinger with turtle's wing amorous clouds dividing waving the wide her myrtle wand she strikes a universal peace through sea and land so before jesus christ uh <clears throat> born on earth god first sent peace isn't it god first sent peace to prepare the way for jesus christ isn't it peace means dove okay so dove that white dove came on her earth holding that myrtle leaf myrtle okay so when uh, yeah so when um dove lashed its wings through the clouds what happened actually uh, through it uh, with his wings 
dove has uh, broken hmm, the clouds and it reached earth yeah she uh, i mean the dove came on earth with crowns and olive garlands and a myrtle branch so you might have seen uh, on the yeah um, in bible or the what do you call movies people holding myrtle branch hmm, olive garlands etc so it is the peace hmm, in the form of dove who came on earth first to prepare the way for jesus christ holding myrtle branch and crown made of olive okay olive leaves in third stanza okay in fourth stanza no war no battle sound was heard world around the idol spear shield were high unspung the hook chariot stood unstained with hostile blood the trumpet spake not to arm throng and kings <clears throat> stayed still with awful eye and if they surely knew that so one lord was by okay so what happened in fourth stanza hmm? no sooner did uh what do you call the bird reached the earth that means dove or the peace hit on earth under her influence all armies hmm, of the world hmm, uh who were battling or fighting until then they put away their swords hmm? so kings warriors and other soldiers they sense something had happened hmm? or something had happened or something is going to happen something you know divinely is going to happen i told you what happened in third stanza we have seen that um see god sent peace in the form of dove to earth holding myrtle branch in fourth stanza poet says that under the influence of peace or the dove all armies of the world yeah have put away their swords and now they are at peace king soldiers and other warriors in the world they sense something that is divine hmm? so, or something that is going to <coughs> happen now fifth stanza but peaceful was the night wherein the pr prince of light he reign of the peace upon the earth began the winds with wonder whisked smoothly the water kissed whispering new joys to the mild ocean who now hath quite forgot to rave while the birds of calm sit brooding on the charm wave okay so in the fifth stanza Jesus Christ the but peaceful was the night the night Jesus Christ was born that night was very peaceful hmm? it is the reign of peace upon the earth hmm? so that that night marks the night on which Jesus Christ was born marks the reign of peace on earth wind kissed the ocean and whispered sweetly that see to cease the rolling okay wind told the tides in the ocean and sea, uh, sea to cease roaring okay so everything on earth became very calm and quiet hmm? now all beings are at peace hmm? when jesus christ was born on earth now moving on to the sixth stanza stars with deep amaze stand fixed steadfast gaze bending one way their uh prettiest influence and will not take their flight for all morning light or lucifer that often warned them thence but in the glimmering orbs did glow until their lord himself be speak and bid, uh, bid them go so lucifer <coughs> i think at least uh, some of you are familiar with lucifer uh who is lucifer Lu lucifer is the brightest star isn't it like brightest star who waged war with the god for that reason he has lost the heavenly position and he uh, fell into the hell isn't it so lucifer the brightest star so jesus christ is hmm, far more brighter than lucifer okay so what happened when jesus christ was born on earth stars are so fixed by the birth of king actually these stars celestial heavenly bodies are very uh, isn't it very bright but when jesus christ was born on earth what happened 
they were so fixed hmm? yeah they were wonder struck hmm, by seeing the face of jesus christ okay they didn't retire for morning hmm, until they were asked to go by god okay stars hmm, it is uh, during the yeah it is in the uh, midst of the night jesus christ was born so on seeing the face of jesus christ these stars were wonder struck so even when the morning uh, came stars were still in the sky because they uh, they are so you know uh, they were in a fixed position they could uh, 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 so the god hmm, the god asked them to retire from there okay now so he, in the fifth, sixth stanza poet says that jesus christ is the brightest object in the universe the baby jesus the face of baby jesus is the brightest thing in the world he surpassed all other heavenly spheres stars lucifer hmm? so they were so ashamed uh, ashamed to see his face and they were in a fixed position hmm? they were so fixed they were so startled surprised to see his face now stanza number 7 and though the shady gloom had given day her room the sun himself withheld his wanton speed and his head for shame as his inferior flame new enlightened world no more should need he saw a greater sun appear than his bright throne burning alex we could yeah axel we could bear okay so what happened uh so we have seen in sixth stanza that stars were still there in the due uh, in the morning after that what happened actually morning is a time of sun isn't it it is the time of sun sun replaces the star normally but you know sun is so reluctant to come out of the clouds hmm? because he under see sun is the um, at least when we look from the earth sun is the brightest object in the sky isn't it but this time sun is so reluctant to come outside of the clouds why because he understood that he is nothing in front of baby jesus christ so though not in <coughs> full bloom hmm, uh, see sun reduced his speed and reluctant to come he felt that he is far inferior to what newborn baby okay yeah so we have completed first seven stanza so here see poet gives a description about jesus christ what happened uh, when jesus christ was born how nature prepared uh, to receive uh, jesus christ uh, yeah then who was sent on earth before to prepare the way for jesus christ it was peace hmm? then we have also seen that the changes brought uh, on earth hmm? uh do uh, yeah uh, after the arrival of peace on earth hmm, that was only a beginning peace is only an attendant of jesus christ so when peace hit the world everything that means all battles hmm, all kind of quarrels fighting etc feud etc have been stopped hmm, that is just a beginning then when jesus christ was born even the sto- stars ocean hmm, uh i mean tides etc all those violent things have been calmed down now all those beings living and non living thing all are at peace hmm? and the sun is now hiding in the clouds deck because he feels so inferior when compared to jesus christ so these are the things that he we have discussed uh, in stanza 1 from stanza 1 to 7 and though yeah stanza number 8 though the shady gloom had given day her room the sun himself withheld his, yeah that we have completed uh stanza number 8 the shepherd on the lawn over the point of dawn said simply chatting the rustic road full fill the thought that they uh, that the mighty pan was keenly come to live with them below perhaps the loves or else the sheep was all that did their silly thoughts so busy keep so what happened when they heard the sweet music see shepherds hmm, uh, who were talking about the rustic things hmm, yeah they uh 
uh, on hearing the birth of Jesus Christ, hmm, they too started think about love. Hmm? Even see shepherds, hmm? they they are busy discussing uh, rural jokes hmm? or rural stuff, and they are engaged in rustic conversation. Okay, so uh, when Jesus Christ was born, soon their in you, know, you know thoughts were diverted uh, to love. Not only them, but also their sheep. Now. <coughs> Stanza number nine. When such music sweet, their heart was heart and ears did greet, as never was mortal finger struck divinely wo wobbled voice and answering the string noise, as all their souls in the blissful rapture took. So, what happened when Jesus Christ was born? Uh, divinely, someone is yeah, someone is playing a, uh, a sweet music. Hmm? So entire creatures on earth and yeah, and in the heaven could hear hmm, some divine music. So shepherds understood that. I mean, earthly beings understood that no mortal, no man could play such a divine music. Hmm? Only someone celestial or only some godly creature can produce such a divine music. Now. Stanza number 10. Nature that heard such sound beneath the hollow round of Cynthia's seat, the airy region thrilling now was almost one to think her, to think her part was done and that her reign had here at last full, fulfilling. She knew such a harmony alone could hold all heaven and earth in happier union. So nature, nature now understood that her life has come to a completion, isn't it? Whenever, see, nature, we can equa equate it to a female, isn't it? Uh, normally, uh, we believe, hmm, majority of the yeah female kind believe that their life comes to a circle or comes to a complete, yeah, uh, I mean, life come, I mean, female life comes to a completion when they give birth to a baby, isn't it? When they carry and give birth to a baby. Similarly, nature, who is compared, who is assumed as a female uh, in the poem, here poet says that her life has come to a circle or come to a, a completion when Jesus Christ has born on earth. Hmm? She has completed all her duty. Yeah. Then nature on hearing such a divine music, what happened? Uh, under Moon's kingdom, hmm, she felt that hmm, okay, her life is fulfilled. She now <clears throat> and the music hmm, that is heard during the birth of Jesus Christ. Hmm, she cannot produce such a divine music, not at all. She, but also her offerings cannot produce such a divine music. Okay, now stanza number eleven. So in stanza number 11, at last surrounded the sight a globe of circular light that with long beams shame fat night arrayed. The hem cherubins, the sword sapphirins are seen in glittering ranks with wings displayed, harping in loud and solemn choir with unexpressive notes to heaven's newborn hair. So in 11 stanza, poet talks about the different uh, hierarchies of stars archangels so there are so many stars isn't it cherubin sapphirins okay like that so entire angels of heaven hmm, join the choir actually already some music is some divine music is uh, being played we don't know who is playing maybe the cosmic or uh, yeah is playing so all those angels belong to different strata or different hierarchy they too join the choir and they lit up the sky along with the stars. Okay, now in stanza number 12, such music before was never made when of old sons of morning sung, while creator great his constellation set and well-balanced world on the hinges hung and the cast dark foundation deep, bit weltering wave their oozy channel keep. So, such heavenly music was never made, even at the time of uh, the creation of heaven and earth. See, we know that earth created the heaven and earth. So here poet says that 
the divine music that is heard or produced at the uh, birth of Jesus Christ was never heard even when the earth was created or when the heaven was created. This is for the first time entire being in the world and in the universe. Hmm? It is for the first time, uh, I mean, entire cosmic creatures hearing uh, such a divine music. Okay, it is to balance the life of the, this music. The very motive of the divine music is to balance hmm, the harmony in the world, isn't it? Whenever he, we, we hear uh, something harmonious to our ears, we will become very happy, we will become very peaceful, isn't it? So the heavenly music which, which is played or which has been produced at the time of Jesus Christ is quite capable of putting everyone at peace. Okay, so we have completed stanzas 8 to 12. So here the poet talks about shepherds uh, who used to crack jock about their rustic jocks. Mm, suddenly their attention turned to uh, Jesus Christ because they felt something mysterious suddenly they started to think about love hmm? until then they were talking they were busy talking about the uh, rustic jocks or gossips suddenly at the time of jesus christ their attention turned towards love okay and nature started to make nature the cosmic etc started to make music and uh, nature feels that she her life is completed hmm? she is complete that means she has done her duty in receiving Jesus Christ. Then, uh, see, then a poet says that no creature in the universe has, yeah, no creature in the universe has heard such a divine music before. It is for the first time uh, they are hearing it. And poet says that that music is quite capable of putting everyone at ease. Now, stanza number 13. Ring out you crystal spear, once bless our human ears. If you have power to touch our senses, so let your silver shine. Move in melodious time and let the base of heaven deep gorgon blow with your ninefold harmony. Make a full concert to angel like symphony. Okay. So, yeah, in the 13th stanza, ring out your crystal spheres. Here, crystal spheres means, uh, I mean, planets, stars. Hmm? etc so yeah poet is asking all celestial spheres to make music along with the angels and stars okay so and with your nine fold harmony there are nine planets right so he's asking the um, solar system to join hmm? the angel symphony all the stars and planets are asked to join the heavenly music Okay, now poet, yeah, poet, um, stanza number 14. For if such holy song and wrap our fancy long, time will run back and fetch the age of gold, and speckled vanity will sicken soon and die. Leprous sin will melt from earth, earthly mold, and hell itself will pass away. Leave her doll dress mansion to the appearing day. So See, if the entire creatures, planets, stars, angels, if all the souls on earth and in the universe, if they can merge their souls with that of the divine music, then all the sins, all the vanities, all those, you know, all the evil things that existed, until the birth of Jesus Christ, if they are able to follow, the, if they are able to sing along with that divine music, then all the sins will shrink away from the earth. Paul says that if, if you can go along with that music, if you can flow along with that music, then all so sins will be uh, what <coughs> washed away from the face of earth. Yeah. Now, 15. You truth and justice then will down return to men. The enameled arrays to the rainbow, 
bow wearing and mercy set between the throne in celestial sheen with radiant feet tissue uh, uh, tissued clouds down steering heaven at some festival will open wide gates or high palace okay so along with jesus christ hmm, who all came on earth who are the attendants of jesus christ to truth justice mercy everything returned on earth to establish hmm, their kingdom so whenever the king comes hmm, he is always followed by the train isn't it in earth as well as in heaven the situation is same king will have so many atten uh, attendees isn't it uh, so you know group of attendees hmm, is called the train so along with jesus christ who all came on earth truth justice mercy and peace they all came on earth yeah so in stanza 13 to 15 yeah milton uh, calls out music to play so that if uh, all of us can, if all of us can join the music then we can brought back that heaven on earth that is once hmm, lost to us okay and uh, yeah once again that heaven will be open to us now, so in stanza number 16 yeah, but wisest faith says, no, this must not yet be so. The baby lies yet in smiling infancy that not that on the bitter cross must redeem our laws. So both himself and us to glory. Yet first to those you chained in sleep, wakeful from of doom must thunder through the deep. So see, Jesus, in this stanza, uh, poet says that, see, Okay, the eternal king or the king of the universe has taken birth on earth, but he is still in infancy stage. Okay, he too uh, has to go through all those sufferings, hmm? all those sufferings and pain. Then only he can uh, redeem the sins of human beings or human race, isn't it? In order to provide salvation or in, in order to bring that greater peace on earth, one should first undergo suffering and uh, pain. And Jesus Christ, who has taken birth on earth in human form, he too has to go through all these fire and what? water. He too has to undergo fire and water. So, yeah, so the wisest of all, that is God. Hmm? I mean, yes, Jesus Christ is popularly known as son of the God, isn't it? Uh, the God, yeah, he's asking the human beings to wait. Hmm? Because it is necessary that, hum first of all, uh, Jesus Christ, hmm? who is in infancy state, to provide salvation to the human beings, he must first taste bitterness of life. So did Jesus Christ suffered yeah, a lot of pain for the uh, for the sake of humanity. So God says that in order to provi provide protection and salvation to the human race, first of all, Jesus Christ himself should undergo bitterness and suffering. Okay, I'm sorry. One second. Yeah, one second. Okay, now in Sansta number 17. With such a hooded clang as on Mount Sinai rang, while the red fire smoldering clouds outbreak, the aged earth, aghast with stir of that blast, shall from the surface to the center shake when at the world's last session, dreadful judge in the middle. Yes, so what happened? Hearing the birth of Jesus Christ, hmm, there are so many pigs. So, from, please note it. Please note it from stanza 17 onwards, poet turns his attention towards other religion and pagan gods. I mean, gods other than, uh, uh, um, what do you call it? Jesus Christ. Okay. He talks about the very condition and the pathetic plight of other pagan gods after the birth of Jesus Christ. So, hearing the birth of Jesus Christ, hmm? What happened? Uh, see, all pagan, all evil, uh, the reign of evil uh, gods on earth have come to an end. He says that Jesus Christ uh, came to earth, so has to 
judge the dead hmm, and provide uh, blessing to the living. Okay. Stanza number 18. Then at last have a bless full and perfect shape, but now begins far, sorry, now begins forth from this happy day. The old dragon underground in straight limbs bound, not half so far cast unsurp, usurp sway and wrath to see his kingdom fail. Swing, yeah, swinges the uh, scaly horror of his folded tail. Okay, so what happened in 18 stanza? In 18 stanza, uh, yeah, poet says that, uh, see, other pagan gods such as dragon hmm? yeah dragon is popularly associated with chinese myth isn't it dragon yeah uh who was reigning hmm? uh in certain part of the earth hearing the birth of jesus christ hmm? uh he was frightened and he fled from the earth okay now <clears throat> See, the very birth of Jesus Christ, it has, you know, put uh, Satan and his followers hmm, at stake. One second. Um, in st stanza number 19, the oracles are dumb and no voice or hideous hum. Runs through the arc roof in world, deceiving Apollo from his shrine. Can no more divine with hollow shriek the steep of Delphos leaving. No nightly trance and breath uh, spell insp inspires the pale priest from the prophetic cell so you know from edmund spencer onwards edmund spencer then what do you call marlowe shakespeare other metaphysical poets such as john dunn andrew marvel hmm, all of them have glorified uh, what do you call the greek mythology or the greek poets in there yeah, sorry, Greek gods in their poems, isn't it? Normally, Apollo is having a good status or a divine status in English literature, isn't it? Whenever we have, we want to compare anything, any, uh, per, yeah, anything that is related with perfection, art, music, literature, we relate or we provide that. What we invoke Apollo, hmm? we relate everything that is perfect to Apollo, but. You know, Milton is entirely different from other poets. He doesn't want to glorify other uh, any other god other than Jesus Christ. Okay. Uh, he's not holding Apollo or uh, uh, Venus, hmm? uh, Zeus, etc. Hmm? He's not holding them up. He's only worshipping Jesus Christ. So in this stanza, he uh, says that Apollo, hmm? uh, who was until the uh, who was shining bright on his seat until the birth of jesus christ hmm, understood that he is no more divine hmm? uh, yeah that means his seat hmm, his divine throne has started to shake uh, uh, apollo hmm, the sun god has a temple at delphi in greece okay so he fled from his temple in greece so no nightly trance and breath spell inspire the pale eyed priest from prophetic cell. So those priests who are chanting the spell of God, goddesses in, in other religion, in, even they become so speechless. Okay. So after the birth of Jesus Christ, no oracles, no de deceitful prophecies spell uh, is heard from uh, the temples of Delphi. In, Apollo hmm, has fled his throne, left his throne. All other, yeah, all pagan gods hmm, have become speechless. Until then, people who were worshipping other pagan gods, hmm, uh, uh, yeah, uh, un uh, uh, until, until the birth of Jesus Christ, now they are so speechless. They cannot sing the praise of other gods because they were so wonderstruck by the birth of Jesus Christ. Now, now twenty. 
stanza number 20 the lonely mountain over the resounding shore a voice of weeping heard and loud lament from haunted spring and day edged the edged with popular pain parting genius is with sign sent the flowers interwoven and stresses torn the yeah nymphs in twilight shade of tangle thickets moan okay so in this stanza poet says that those deities or those evil gods who are uh, residing hmm, uh, at the top of mountains okay especially oriental oriental gods hmm, gods from eastern mythology yeah yes most of the greek and hindu gods believe to oh, have abodes at the top of mountains right so milton says that all those gods or pagan gods who are residing at the top of the mountain hmm? he, uh, uh, he can hear the lamenting or uh, yeah the lamenting sound of such pagans okay so lamenting is heard from the valleys and sounds of uh, yeah valleys okay now guardian angels yeah displaced i mean those guardian that those evil guardian angels hmm were displaced now in stanza number 21 in consecrated earth and on holy earth the last lemurs mourn with midnight plain in arms altars round yeah a dear right dying sound afrise the flames at the service quaint and chill marble seems to sweat which each peculiar power forgoes his wont seek so wails and lamenting sounds hmm, can be heard from different part of the earth isn't it after the birth of jesus christ hmm, all those uh, i mean the very position of all those pagan gods are at stake so evil spirits started to wail from the graveyard hmm? lamenting sounds of the different gods can be heard from the top of the mountain valley uh, and from the coffin so temples hmm, seem to uh, what all the gods from the temple hmm, they fled away from there now stanza number 22 pure balin forsake the temple dim with twice battered god of palestine and moon astrophet uh, heaven's queen mother both now sit god with tapers holy shite by halibia hamnon shrinks his horn in vain the train mates with the wounded tamzo mourn so other gods from palestine israel egypt all of them have hmm, uh, left their place fearing fearing uh, jesus christ hmm, fearing the uh, arrival hearing the arrival of jesus christ all those gods fear balmain astropath hamon the most all those pagan gods have left their place okay some of these gods even demanded the very sacrifice of the newborn babies so such evil gods have cleared their uh yeah cleared from earth now stanza number 23 and sullen moloch fled has fled in shadow dreaded in his burning idol all black as hue in vain the symbol ring they are called the grisly king the smell dance about the furnace blue the brutish god of nai fast is his horus and the dog anubis okay <laughs> so you know now in stanza number 23 poet speaks about the egyptian god hmm? moloch he flees from his burning idol hmm? uh yeah then an another cruel gods other cruel gods like anubis uh, you might have heard about anubis in hmm? those who have seen the movies or uh, movies like mummy returns hmm? yeah to mock the dragon king i think you are pretty familiar with anubis so such type of gods hmm? have cleared fr uh, from earth now stanza number 25 nor is osiris seen mephane roof green trampling unshower brace with loving lute nor can he be at rest within sacred chest okay so 
or or is yeah ori ori is is another god okay he too is nowhere to be seen okay he cannot be at peace except in hell so he too fled from earth to hell okay now people so people are searching for oris see these people until then worship the pagan god now they are searching for the, uh, their deities from temple to temple now stands on number 25 here yeah he feels from judas land dreaded infant's hand the rays of bethlehem blinds the dusky uh, eye and nor all god beside longer dare abide nor typhon huge ending in the snaky twine our babe to shew his godhead true can in the swirling bands and control the damned dew so see entire creature and evil gods were blinded by the divine light of jesus christ okay so from bethlehem jesus christ is shedding such a um, divine light that forced all other pagan gods hmm, to flee from earth now 26 stanza so when the sun is in bed curtailed with cloudy red pillows his chin upon the orient wave flocking sh uh, shadows pale troop to the infernal jail each fettered ghost slips to his several grave and yellow skirted of uh, yeah pace fly after the night steeds leaving the moon love maze so in 26 stanza poet says that see sun who is already reluctant to come outside of the cloud because of his inferior position to the baby jesus christ now he sits down hmm, uh, behind the red red curtain red cur red curtains means we know that sun is red color during sunset and uh, sunrise so now he is you know he's so reluctant to come out but he is eager to sit down hmm, he want to rest so yeah so by the time sun sets and takes rest on the yellow hmm? uh what do you call yellow ocean hmm? with red pillows all evil gods march towards jail jail means all evil gods on earth march towards the hell so hell is the jail here okay now last answer but see the virgin bless hath laid her baby to rest time is so uh, time is our tedious song should here have ending heaven's youngest team star hath fixed her polish car first sleeping lord with handmaid lamb attending and all about the courtly stable bright Harness angels sit in order, so visible. So what happened? See, when other extraordinary or the celestial thing and the evil gods are all have already got what some hint about the birth of Jesus Christ. They are already aware of the birth of Jesus Christ and they know the real uh what they know the real power of Jesus Christ. So fearing that they have fled from earth. But Mary, Virgin Mary, she is not at all aware about the very uh, divinely stat, uh, status of his, uh, sorry, status of her son. So she, as every mother, she is putting her baby to sleep. Okay. And group of angels are standing hmm, um, outside the barn. Hmm? Uh, yeah. They are standing outside the barn uh, they are so ready to attend him they are waiting for his uh, orders to carry it out okay that is the 27th stanza so with this we have completed nativity odd okay so in this poem poet, uh, poet covers the birth of jesus christ and the changes uh, brought on earth after the birth of Jesus Christ, what happened to other pagan gods. And it also talks about a mother's love, hmm? mother's love for her baby. 
even though the baby is divine uh, he's the god, son of the god hmm? savior of the human race mom is not quite aware about the divine divinely status of the baby just like every mother she is attending uh, putting her baby to sleep while all other creatures heavenly things are waiting outside for his uh, to carry out his orders yeah okay so we have completed the nativity ode now <coughs> let's move on to lisidus one second lisidus okay so lisidus is the famous pastoral elegy written by john milton in 1637 uh it appeared in the collection of uh, uh, elegies title just a uh, edrodo king nephropox okay so this lesidas hmm, is actually milton's best friend edward king hmm, who was drowned to death yeah so the poem is dedicated uh, to edward king so he has been uh, see what represented as lisidus in this poem now the pastoral it is a pastoral elegy what is pastoralism pastoral is in pastoralism shepherd sorry poet will uh, look at life hmm, from the angle of shepherd the central person or the person uh, who is lamented hmm, who has been lamented or who has been mourned will be projected or or will be presented as shepherd the, the main theme of pastoral poetry or the pastoral elegy is to look at life from shepherd's point of view or shepherd's angle okay so yeah the poem has 9193 lines regular rhyme okay so i already told you what a pastoral elegy is hmm? it is uh, yeah the background of the poem is rustic 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 themes hmm? main character shepherds so take a quick look at the features of pastoral poetry okay so just like any other epic just like in epithalamium odyssey iliad ramayana or mahabharata in a pastoral elegy also poet will invoke the muse some kind of some muse of goddess god goddess okay okay then elegy that song elegy is a lyrical poem where the poet will be lamenting mm, mm, at the death of his dear or near ones okay basically the expression of grief hmm? poet will be praising the deceased one or the one who has passed away okay so yeah and another major feature of the uh, pastoral elegy is untimely poet will be blaming the untimely arrival of death then uh the poet will present the deceased one or the person who is uh dead he will be presented as the hero or the king of the uh yeah realm okay then the next part of the the second half of the pastoral poetry will deal with the immortality or resurrection of that dead soul okay first of all he will uh, share his grief about losing the dead friend then he will present him as the king hmm, or a person of significance thereafter he would discuss if he were alive what he would have done then he will consoles himself telling that hmm, actually the particular person has been his status has been immortalized okay so these are uh, these are the key features of pastoral poetry invocation expression of grief uh, blames the untimely arrival of death then elevating the deceased person to the position of king 
then providing immortality thereafter uh, yeah placing him among the angels please note it so i have already told you the deceased person will be uh, recasted or given the role of the shepherd another myth uh, another thing is he uh, so many mythical characters from greek roman etc will be used in pastoral elegies just like spencer has used in epithalamium and prothalamium in pastoral elegies poet will draw so many mythical characters or uh, yeah the central character will be compared to mythical characters okay so see elizabeth the prologue section serves as a pro, uh, yeah uh, what introduction to the poem just like in nativity or we have introductory stanza okay here also we have we have prologue so in the prologue milton is invoking the muses just like spencer invoked muses to provide him strength to write the poem hmm? it is common among all great poets okay so uh, after the death of edward king milton has lost all his vigor and strength to write poetry and he decided not to write until he matures hmm? but you know that such such a sad occasion had compelled him to write an elegy hmm? so in this poem he is lamenting upon the untimely death of his friend edward king who has been described as listed as in this poem so listed as a uh, roman or a greek general okay who had died for the uh, sake of his people yeah he, he was torn to death listed as uh, yeah he, Uh, if you read mythology, you you can understand that is a Roman general who was torn to death by his own people. Actually, he died for his people. Okay. So I told you, uh, Milton starts this poem with an invocation to muses. He compares himself to a shepherd. Hmm. When the poem opens, he compares himself himself to a shepherd plucking berries, laurels, myrtle. Hmm. Before the mellowing time. poet describes lycidas and himself hmm? that is uh, let me tell you um, john milton and edward king were uh, classmates hmm? in christ college okay in christ college uh, john milton because of his uh, feminist features hmm? he was known as the la uh, lady of the christ or yeah so john milton and uh, edward king they were peacefully spending their time in the college so yeah you know other undergraduates used to look at them with awe and admiration okay so here the poet says that undergraduate used to crowd around them because these two these two people were very famous hmm, in college uh, for their literary skills so they are compared to satyrs and fauns of greek mythology their juniors john milton and edward king they studied together uh, so while they were uh, doing the post graduation hmm, in the college all their undergraduates hmm, they used to crowd around them they used to uh, their juniors used to worship them and these juniors compared them to greek mythical characters okay so yeah <clears throat> poet then says that poet is very sad on the accidental uh, as i said hmm, death of his classmate he wonders what the gods and goddesses were doing while edward king was down to death hmm? what they were doing they are so blind hmm? then milton uh take some digressions okay he shifts his attention so there are two digressions in the poem the first digression is see 
he talks about see if edward king was alive if he if he were alive hmm, he would have reached hmm, that kingly status okay uh and here milton analyzes or yeah reviews the very purpose hmm, of edward king's life so milton knows that writing poetry is a hard task and see every great poet must work hard to write a good poem so see milton doesn't want to have that cheap pop uh, popularity hmm? because he is a puritan hmm? he can only write about the lofty things there are so many other poets who writes about the love hmm? and other trivial things he cannot write like other poets hmm? who uh, who yeah who write about love and similar kind of stuff he being a puritan he can only write about lofty things okay so now he so john milton says that being an honest puritan uh, and yeah he devotes all his principle to puritanism and ascetic values now <clears throat> second digression in the poem is see he introduces saint peter to the mourners see so many people have joined uh, the mourners hmm? uh, who uh, yeah who are lamenting the death of edward king so who came saint peter's saint peter's came so saint peter hmm, is very angry at the corrupt clergymen of the day he says that all clergymen and all people who are associated with the church hmm, at present are corrupted hmm? he laments the death of king edward hmm? king edward uh, at that time was doing the subject of theology in christ college both milton and edward king they studied in the christ college under cambridge university okay so they are lamenting the death of edward king so all those clergy men hmm, or people who are associated with church they they are into church not because of the belief or devotion to the religion but simply they need to fill their belly and pocket that is why these men are coming to church so saint peter blames all those fake christians there are i told you there are two digressions in the poem after invoking the muse after introducing edward king Mm, and how they are related poet blames gods mm, and goddesses for shutting eyes against edward king what they were doing when he perished mm. then he takes two digression telling that milton being a staunch puritan uh, he cannot write poems on trivial themes like love stories if he had written poems on love his poems would to have sold like hot cakes but he cannot write any trivial poems he is his principles hmm, are dedicated to puritanism and ascetic life okay so we can only write about religious themes only about lofty themes then the second digression he talks about saint peter hmm, who joins the mourners hmm, when he joined the mourners there are so many clergymen church uh, people who are in church okay so he says that those people are fake hmm? why because most of the people uh, came to church or joins the um, join the church so has to fill their belly and pocket now after the second digression milton you know comes back to the pastoral energy he he invites the valleys hmm, uh, to you know we have mountains trees plants etc to cast the different colors of flowers hmm, upon the dead body of lizardus lizardus is lying dead there hmm? he he's yeah he's he was drowned to death so milton wants to play a rich tribute to his friend so he is asking 
valleys mountain tops trees upon uh, trees in the valleys and mountain tops to cast their flowers differently cl uh, colored flowers upon the dead body of lycidas okay now suddenly the poet realizes that dead body is not there because we know that hmm, lycidas or the edward king list is cc uh, died for a noble cause actually he was there to protect his people against the against a tyrant king but due to some confusion he was stoned to death by his own people similarly edward king was also a Pur uh, puritan he was studying the subject of theology when he died so he yeah according to milton he, he's a noble person uh yeah he died early because he was called by the god because his service is most wanted in the heaven so while this person was paying a rich tribute to edward king suddenly his body disappears okay that means just like lazarus was resurrected hmm? isn't it just like jesus christ was resurrected edward king too was resurrected hmm? now he joined the company of god and angels in the heaven so his friend is not actually diseased or dead but he has rebirth in heaven now he is enjoying the precious company of god and angels so this poem ends with a note of joy and hope okay so this is a poem based on uh, christian doctrine where uh lisad lisidas is first presented as, sorry edward king is first presented as a shepherd he has been given the name lisidas hmm? then he talks about the untimely death he laments upon his death uh he glorifies the merits of edward king then he talks about the corruption in church and people who fake them to be uh i mean following the christian doctrines hmm? thereafter he says that the person has been resurrected to heaven now he is enjoying the company of god and god okay so that's all about lisidus it's a very easy poem <coughs> now the next poem is lelegro this is a companion poem lelegro and el pinizero So Lelegro is a pastoral poem by John Milton published in 1649 composed shortly after Milton left Cambridge so you know this poem he has written while he was too young very young Lelegro means happy man in italian uh, mm -hmm, yeah in it italian language the po uh, the title means the happy man the companion poem is il penseroso that means melancholy man serious man and the happy man so let me tell you this poem he has written soon after he left his college and il pensero he has written after taking 10 years gap that means uh, after becoming a matured man so his viewpoint etc the yeah his views themes uh, that has uh, dealt in both poem are entirely different anyway they so uh, they balance each other okay let's go along with pensero hmm? uh, actually explores the contrasting sides of hmm, life hmm? okay one deals with the pleasure and another deals with the wisdom because when you are too young you want to uh, have a colorful life isn't it want to have a happy life hmm? once you attains the age of 30 or 35 plus you are busy <coughs> in not um, enjoying your life but amassing wealth say like wisdom that's the difference so lelegro celebrates hmm, grace if frozen through traditional or theocratic and so who is the king uh, i mean originator of pastoral poem theocritus okay theocritus is the what do you called the originator of the pastoral poem so both uh, both poems are set in the mind of poet hmm? rural settings that's the favorite setting of almost all 17th century poet rural setting so yeah 
in this poem poet invokes mirth that means happiness hmm? and uh, yeah he allegra uh, he allegorizes the figures hmm? abstract figures like joy and merriment and he talks about the need of um, leading a happy cheerful life in country side okay so the god of the god goddess happiness or goddess mirth is believed to be the daughter of bacchus and venus bacchus we know other another name for bacchus is dionysius hmm? god of entertainments god of sex god of wine god of war god of all violent things okay and uh, venus so goddess happiness or goddess mirth is the daughter of bacchus and venus so in this poem lelegro poet is invoking hmm, or seeking the company of goddess happiness or goddess mirth so another different themes that has been dealt in the poem is he talks about uh, the profession of writing then he admires pastoral life hmm? then he talks about the classical philosophies etc all the colorful side of life he he glorifies all colorful side of life in lalegro so when the poem starts speaker hmm this lelegro that is the happy man hmm he says he is in need of a life full of pleasure yeah so he is asking he is rejecting the goddess melancholy hmm uh yeah he doesn't want to doesn't want goddess melancholy to ac uh, accompany him he's asking her to go away go away from he, her, him Uh, the goddess melancholy has been personified as a uh, beast or a horrible creature hmm? uh, he, uh, he is you know uh, so eager to welcome the god euphrosin that means the goddess of happiness or goddess goddess mirth hmm? i already told you who uh, who is who mirth is mirth is the daughter of venus and bacchus hmm? in another version it has been said that she is the daughter of sapphire that is west wind and aurora aurora okay the dawn so when mirth comes she comes along with her followers that is names hmm, another friends like joy peaceful hmm, peace there are so many see all abstract qualities have been personified in lelegro and il pedestro okay yeah so in this poem he talks about a day spent in the company of villagers hmm? in or in a very peaceful rustic background so another peculiarity of this poem is he is not a participant he is just a spectator he just gives a record of pastoral things rather than participating in pastoral activities he describes them just like a third person okay so when he enters hmm, that rustic world hmm he was so fascinated by the peaceful morning hmm? the crowing of the cock hmm? ha, the the busy farmers milkman hmm? plowmen is describing them now how they are spending their uh, day from morning till evening hmm? they are so busy working hard there after there after their work they are engaging in different types of activities merry making activities hmm uh, yeah just like yeah after their work they gather and they share normal uh, what do you call the so called used jocks then in this poem he talks about some 
festivals hmm? tournaments wedding party etc so he has been to all these places he is not a participant he is observing hmm? that rural happiness he is a happy man here hmm? he is a happy man who is uh, who is enjoying the pleasant company of ordinary people like plowmen milkmen hmm? farmers hmm? simple ones okay simple minded ones they are so happy because they don't have any huge expectation and he is also accompanied by mirth goddess of mirth is with him so he is so happy or eurydice hmm? eurydice is the you know not eurydice you frozen okay so he doesn't want melancholy to approach him so he only wanted to befriend goddess of mirth so he compares himself to that of orpheus orpheus story i have already uh, told you while discussing the second block orpheus is the one who uh, tried to convince pluto and his wife so has to get his wife soul back so similarly milton is also trying to convince eurydice so has to keep her away from goddess of melancholy so i already told you lelegro and lelpensro hmm, represents two sides of life serious side and a uh, very happy state hmm, of life carefree life and a very contemplative life and of uh, age from 16 to 25 26 we lead a very carefree life and thereafter our life become very serious so lelegro uh, deals with the what do you call the carefree life and penisro deals with the contemplative life Now, the second poem, companion poem, Il Penis Rosso. Okay, so Il Penis Rosso, that is also a lyrical poem, just like Lelegro. Ah, uh, here also, poet begins like an begins with an argument. He's banishing all vain, deluding joy. See, in Lelegro, he abandons. or he rejects melancholy hmm, from joining his crew he say he says her to go away but when he becomes older hmm, yeah when he uh, when he grew old he understood the reality of life actually goddess of mirth or goddess of happiness or the so called happiness can't provide any higher wisdom to people only melancholy can provide wisdom or knowledge to people okay yeah so he is welcoming melancholy here now so he says that men are very happy when they are uh, in solitude so solitude means after completing his you know that is also a loneliness but a blissful kind of loneliness not the one rendered by others one when one keeps yeah oneself in solitude it will be like a blessing okay so when he is in solitude he loves to walk through the woods hmm he loves to walk through the corridors of the library hmm, where he loves to read books hmm, uh which provide higher kind of pleasure hmm, or the greater reality is only uh yeah the greater realities can be only seen in tragedies and heroic literature okay and scriptures of church so those people hmm, who are so trivial they will waste their time reading love stories hmm but If you want to attain that higher type of wisdom or greater wisdom, one should first visit or read hmm? what scriptures, church scriptures, and tragedies. So here, melancholy is the daughter of Saturn and Vesta. That means divine fire. Saturn is a solitary god, god of yeah, high seriousness. Okay. So our melancholy is as beautiful as Ethiopian queen Cassiopeia transformed into a, uh, a star. So here in this poem, he invokes melancholy to come forth 
along with her companion so mirth had you know so many companions like joy yeah dawn beauty fair etc were her companions melancholy's companions are peace quiet fast leisure contemplation see see these are abstract qualities uh, a person will have when he grows old isn't it so me- when melancholy comes she will bring all her companions okay so he welcomes hmm? so when he is mo- he loves to he is asking melancholy to lead him to through some forest or through the corridors of some university hmm? so at that time he hears the sound of a nightingale which can interrupt the silence so he says then uh in lelegro he is enjoying the country's uh country life wedding party tournament all those kind of celebration he is able to enjoy but now he says that see all these life are so trivial hmm? all those type of enjoyment activities are so trivial hmm? he would rather love to lead a solitary life hmm? in the wood reading his favorite things that means literature of marlowe hmm? shakespeare ben johnson serious type of literature okay and yeah hermit hermetic means he he loves he doesn't want to mingle with others he loves to brood he lo- he wants to contemplate in a, a silent place like wood okay this person that you see in lelegro and penestro are entirely different now so after hmm, uh, he takes a journey with melancholy he goes uh, near the brook hmm. uh, yeah he listens to the mysterious song of nature then the woods he spends a yeah a considerable time in solitude and he understands the greater reality of life so he says that only melancholy can provide that greater type of wisdom she is the reality whereas mirth or joy is deluding is deceptive in nature okay so lelegro he celebrates if uh, uh, frozen goddess of happiness in il penesro he celebrates melancholy goddess of what soro then there are two sonnets the sonnet is pretty famous sonnet number 19 when i consider how my light is spent yeah here half my days in this dark world wide and that one talent which is death to hide lost with me useless though my soul more bent to serve with, there within my maker and present so in this sonnet in the first uh, eight lines hmm, he's asking the god he's asking god see you have taken my divine light hmm? uh so how can you expect labor from me how can you expect work from me uh when i consider how my light is spent hmm? so uh, milton uh, is now rethinking or he is recalling how his uh, life has been spent when he has vision he identifies that when he had vision he was actually blind he was spiritually blind when he lost his vision only he had gained the spiritual vision hmm? the real vision but now he is not in a in position to serve god hmm? even though he really want to sing uh, he really want to sing the pra- uh, praise of god now he cannot hmm? so he is asking how god can ex- uh, expect labor from him hmm? god has denied uh the light of vision so i fondly ask but patience to prevent that mama soon replies god doth not need either man's work 
for or his own gifts who best bear his mile lock day serve him best his state is kingly thousand at bidding speed pours over land and ocean without rest they also serve who only stand and wait so the last six stanza his questions were answered most of the sonnets yeah all sonnets the first octave that means in the first eight lines the first eight lines will be set of questions yeah he is complaining god okay fine uh, i understood that when i had a, a vision when i had actual vision when i had the sight i spend my light in darkness hmm? uh, i have never utilized my true talent hmm? i put them uh, to death but when i lost my sight hmm, i had you, you know gained spiritual vision or spiritual sight but you know i'm not in a position to serve you how can you expect my service hmm, after making me blind at that time uh, god answers his question be patient uh, yeah maybe angel he answers his que question be patient because god doesn't need the service of man god has you know divided small small tasks to everyone uh, those are mild yoke you might have seen your carried by bullocks hmm? bullock uh, bull while plowing the field like that god has given small burden hmm? or small duties to one and all hmm? that means god will be happy if man is able to uh, yeah complete all his duties that he has given to them hmm? god doesn't want any service in return he just wanted his subjects to utilize the skills and talent at, at their best actually there are thousands of archangels to carry out his orders hmm? so he is not in need of the service of a mortal man that is the very gist of when i consider how my life is spent now the next sonnet sonnet number 23 so yeah Milton has married twice hmm? and he has outlived all uh, his wives, isn't it? He is a Puritan, but he has married two times. Okay. And he outlived both his wives. Soon after the childbirth, both his wives passed away. So some say that he is, you know, uh, giving a tribute to his first wife. That is, uh, wait, me, one second, Mary Powell. Some says that he is giving a tribute to the second wife. And some other critic says that hmm, he is paying rich tribute to both his wife. Okay. Me, I saw my late espouse saying brought to me like Alcetus from grave, who Job's great son to her, glad husband game, rescued from death by force, though pale and faint. So see his first wife's name is mary powell and second wife's name is catherine woodcock okay so yeah alcetus alcetus uh, is the heroine who, um, who sacrifices her life to save her husband's life okay so at the command of her husband hercules who is the son of zeus jupiter joe who rescues her Okay, so here he compares Alcetus to his wives. Okay, me thought I saw my late espouse saint. That means his wife, his deceased, he elevated the position of his wife to that of a saint. So in his dream, hmm, he dreamt of his, yeah, he dreamt of his wife, uh, uh, yeah, wife. And now in his dream, they appeared as saints. Hmm? They were brought to me just like uh, Alcetus. Alcetus is a heroine who sacrificed her own life for the to save the life of her husband, who was then rescued by the great son of Zeus, that is Hercules. Okay, mine is as whom washed from the sport of child bed taint, purification in all low did save, and such as yet once I trust to have full sight of her in heaven without restraint. Okay. So, yeah, even though she has departed from me, hmm, now she is enjoying what? A heavenly 
life came vested in all white and pure has mine her face was veiled yet my fancied sight love sweetness goodness in her person shine so how does she appear she came all in white you know after the death of the person yeah after the death of the person uh of death of his wife she joined the company of angels so she appeared in all white she has been compared to that of a angel hmm? her face was veiled hmm? uh yeah she was shining bright hmm? uh he can read love sweetness everything from her face so clear as in no face with more delight but oh as to embrace me incline i waked up she fled day brought back my night so it is during night time hmm? when he slept only in his dream his wife appeared as a saint as a goddess his soul was so elated on seeing her in the white clad i mean in that white dress of angels she is a heavenly thing now hmm? her face is so bright hmm? love sweetness everything reflected on her uh, yeah reflected uh, on her uh, yeah everything reflected from uh, on her face so you know on seeing her face he was so delighted hmm? when he was about to embrace her when he was about to hug her hmm? the day has come the day has fallen hmm? the day arrived hmm? when the day arrives he says that actually the night no for normal people those people who have vision day is bright isn't it and those who don't have vision day is like night for them night is their day because during night time they can sleep they can think about many things uh, all those things that they are unaware to see with their real eyes they can see in their dreams so for those people who are blind night is their day and mm, day is their night so when the morning arrives the soul of his wife disappears and he cannot hug her so he says that when i awake she fled day brought back my night the day has given him grief again okay so that is a summary of the poem so next class we can discuss block number 5 okay we have completed uh, all poems that is prescribed in your syllabus in block 4 okay okay then bye